Hello, everyone. My name is Linda Kenny, and I am really lucky to be the CEO at Kids Ability Center for Child Development. So today at Kids Ability, we're launching something new. We're calling it Kids Ability Convos. This is an opportunity for us to have conversations and just talk about some of the great things that happen at Kids Ability. And I'm really excited today to launch that by having a conversation with members of our kayak committee. At Kids Ability, we call that kayak, but it stands for Kids Ability Youth Advisory Council. And it is a group of young people who advise us at Kids Ability on all sorts of things from our service delivery to how we interact with our communities. I'm just gonna ask each of the members of Kayak to introduce themselves to you today and, uh, and then we'll get the conversation started. So maybe I can start with Natalie. Hi, um, I'm Natalie and I'm one of the co-chairs at the Waterloo Kayak. Excellent, thanks Natalie for joining us. Claire. Hi, I'm Claire and I've been on your pop on um, Kayak for a couple of weeks. And you're with the, the Guelph Kayak, aren't you, Claire? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Noel, would you like to introduce yourself to us? Um, I'm Noel, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Waterloo Kayak, and I've been a member of Kayak for, I think, three years now. Excellent. And Tammy? Hi, I'm Tammy O'Connor, and I'm the Youth Engagement Lead at Kids Ability. So I get the privilege of working with all of our youth leaders through the Kayak group. Excellent. So now I'm turning myself over to uh, to our kayak members and uh, off we go. So how, why did you pick Kids Ability as an organization to work for? So I really love living and working in the same community. I like to go to work and be able to see the difference that Kids Ability is making in the lives of people that are in my own neighborhood and in our own neighborhoods. So when I accepted the job at Kids Ability, I actually figure it's probably going to be my last career move and I really wanted to make it count and I'm so glad I found Kids Ability, but I'm actually really, really glad that Kids Ability picked me. And how long have you been working at Kids Ability? So I came to Kids Ability in April 2013, so a little over seven years. But in my last job, I actually worked with Kids Ability for about six years. So I already knew a whole bunch about the really good work that happened here before I came. How has COVID impacted the services at Kids Ability? How did you find different ways to help the children, youth, and families that Kids Ability service? Well, like everyone else, we were really shocked when we had to close our doors and we had to figure out how to work from home. And at first, we really didn't know how long that was going to last and we didn't really know how we would be able to do that. So behind the scenes, we were all sort of running around trying to figure out computers and chairs and equipment and how we could make all of that work, internet access. And while we were doing that, all of our therapists were actually spending their time reaching out to families. And so within a couple of weeks, I think we had reached just about every family on our caseloads, either by phone or by email. And then within a couple of weeks after that, we'd started to be able to offer virtual therapy. So that was really cool for us. And, um, and it happened pretty quickly, really. And, um, and so our therapist just kind of jumped into that challenge and started doing that. But we also knew that there were some families that virtual therapy just wasn't the right answer for. So as soon as the restrictions started to loosen up, we were able to um, start to bring families back in for face-to-face -face visits in very safe ways. Um, we did it in a very slow, gradual way, making sure that we were keeping our staff and our families safe while we did that. And so now I think, um, you know, we're in a position at Kids Ability like everybody else, but we're, you know, probably forever, we're now going to have this blended model of face-to-face -face service and, um, and um, what we're calling virtual therapy, where we can um, support people based on their clinical needs or on their family needs um, with a variety of options. So that's actually been a pretty great outcome of COVID. Not that COVID's had that many great outcomes, but that's been a good one. 
What has been your favorite thing that you have done with kids ability? Oh, I think that's a really hard question to answer because there are so many great things that go on at kids ability on almost a daily basis. It's kind of what I miss about not working in the office full time anymore is that kind of um, human interaction and hearing kids and stuff like I used to. But I really like uh, when we do a Christmas free, which is um, a program we do once a year and we offer respite to families so that they can go do some shopping, Christmas shopping for a few hours. Um, I like when we do things like I can bike and, um, you know, and kids get an opportunity to learn how to ride a bike. Um, I like what's really happening with you guys. I love what's going on with the kayak group and how you guys are finding your voices. I love the people that I get to work with and, um, and I really just love the difference that we're making for families. So I don't actually have one favorite thing, Claire. What was your journey to becoming the CEO of Kids Ability? So how'd you come about doing that? And what are some like educational steps that um, helped you reach that goal? So I'm actually a social worker by background. Um, but I have to say that I've never really done very much clinical work uh, with my social work degree. I've always been interested in community development work and systems and policies and kind of how you can change, you know, kind of change the world has always sort of been a, a big driver for me. And for almost all of my career, I've worked in the area of ability and disability. I worked at March of Dimes. I've worked in the developmental services sector. I um, was, I did some work working with people, adults with spinal cord injury. And I actually started my career working with kids. And so when I had the opportunity to come back here to Kids Ability, like it just kind of seemed like a really nice, a really nice conclusion and, and to, to come back to what I started at, which you know, was, was working with kids and families. So related to that, what were some skills that um, you needed to fit into this role better? So I think I think it's important to have some sort of background in understanding the work of the organization. Like I don't actually think I'd be a very good CEO in a car manufacturing plant or something, right? I think you kind of have to know a little bit about the work that goes on in the organization. But I actually think that it's even more important to understand the people that work in an organization. And because all of us as a CEO or anybody in the organization, we're only as good as the people who, who, we, who work with us and for the organization. So I think it's, for me, I think it's a lot about characteristics, right? So you have to be able to see all sides of a problem. You have to be able to kind of find good solutions. Um, you have to sort of, I think, be able to picture the future and then make a plan to get there. And, you know, you have to be able to do the right thing, even when it's really hard or really uncomfortable. Um, you have to actually know when you're wrong. And then you have to learn from that. And then you have to be willing to fix that. Uh, I think it is important to, um, to listen and to hear and I think at the end of the day, coming back to what I started with, right, you have to really have passion and really believe in the work that you do, because we spend a lot of time at work and we have to love what we do. And I feel sorry for people who get out of bed in the morning and drag themselves to a job that they hate, because I have never, ever had that happen in my whole life. And I'm so pleased that I, every job I've ever done, I've always loved going to work. Yeah, I definitely think what you said was important, especially loving your job, just because if you don't, there's, you won't enjoy anything that you do and you won't exceed at it. So um, speaking of like exceeding and everything, so what are some responsibilities that um, you do as CEO? So I, I mean, overall, I guess I'm responsible for making sure that Kids Ability does good work and that we help kids and families and that we're a really good place for our employees to work, that we're spending our money and our resources properly, that we're making a difference. So like I'm sort of the face of kids' ability to all of that, but there's lots of other body parts that, uh, that make that whole thing work properly. 
Um, and so the next question is also, who do you report to? So if you're having some difficulties in some location, um, in something, uh, who do you report to? And what is like the structure of kids ability, like the order of um, people? Okay. So I report to the board of directors. The board of directors is a group of 15 volunteers. And so I kind of have 15 bosses. And so they come from all over our community and they come with a whole variety of experiences and skills. And, um, and they, have, they all have a really strong passion for the work that Kidsability does. So I'm really lucky because I can tap any one of those people on the shoulder and, um, and they can help me do my job. But I also am very lucky to have a really good team of people that work here with me on a day-to-day -day basis that I can sort of tap on the shoulder as well. Because you can't be you can't be an expert in everything. And, and I might even say I'm not an expert in anything. I just have a whole lot of people around me who are really good at what they do. And that helps us um, run the organization. So another question is, um, what does a day in the life look for you? So what do you do on a typical day at your job? Well, lately I spend a lot of time with technology, <laughs> just like everyone else. And um, a lot of time in, even before COVID, a lot of time in meetings. Um, I remember one time, you know, going for an appointment and someone is saying to me, you know, what do you do for a living? And I said, I think I talk. I think that's what I do. I just talk. And, um, but, um, but I think, you know, it's um, all of that is sort of around trying to make good decisions, trying to plan the work of kids' ability, trying to represent kids' ability in the community or to government. Um, and um, so, you know, most of that kind of gets done in meetings. And, and um, I like days sometimes when I can just put my head down and do some work. <laughs> So basing it off of uh, everything that you do, um, what do you what would you consider your hardest part of the job? I think the hardest part of my job is knowing that we can't help everybody who asks us for help. Um, I hate the idea that we have wait lists. I think um, that is like the hardest thing, and everything I do is to try and sort of um, come up with magical ways to sort of change that. I really hate sometimes that I have to make decisions that I think will hurt people. Um, and I'm really thankful that I don't have to do that very often, but, um, but that's usually my worst days when I've had to make a really difficult decision and I know that it's hurt somebody, but it, it you know, has been in the best interest of the organization. So would you say um, your hardest part of your leadership role would be the exact same or is it a bit different? Um, I think sometimes it's lonely. Like, you know how they say it's lonely at the top? I think that's actually really true sometimes. You know, you can, you can have lots of great people around you and you can get lots of great input and advice. And, um, but at the end of the day, you know, you're one person and you have to make the decision and you have to live with the consequences of that decision because there's no one else to sort of pass the buck to right so I think sometimes and sometimes when you're really struggling with something and it might be something that's not suitable to be talking to other people about those I think are are the hard things about being in a leadership role and sometimes you're you know you're looking at you're standing at a crossroads and you've got a decision to make and you can go left or you can go right and you just you know sometimes you just have to hold your breath and pick one and hope it's the right one so um and also so how do you manage with things when pro problems arise as you said you have you're by yourself a lot so do you like consult other people I am very lucky. I have a great team of people around me here inside Kids Ability, but I also have a great team of colleagues and contacts outside of Kids Ability as well. And, um, and you know, I, Kids Ability is one of 21 children's treatment centers in the province. And so I have 20 other colleagues who um, I can turn to when I'm really um, struggling with something or I need some help with something. Um, sometimes you don't have to reinvent it because someone else has already done it. 
Um, so I think um, it's pretty hard to imagine that there's a situation that could come up that somebody somewhere in the province hasn't dealt with at least once, right? So um, that's been a really great um, support for me over the years, there's no question. And then I, um, you know, certainly will um, respond to anybody who's asking the same of me, so. So um, on a lighter note, what is the most rewarding part of your job? Well, I, I think, as I said earlier, I just love being a kid's ability. I think it's my dream job. When I started this job, a very good friend of mine said to me one day, it feels like you're doing the job that you spent your whole career preparing for. And I actually feel like that on a really regular basis. Um, I just, you know, I know we have lots of challenges, we have lots of problems, we have lots of things we have to fix and solve and whatever. But I really just know that at the end of the day, I think we make a difference in the lives of kids and families. And I think we, we make a difference in, in our employees and their quality of work. And that, um, that to me is actually just a really great combination. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Um, so what is some advice you have for people that are looking to be in a leadership role similar to yours? And I guess some next steps that they could take to get there. So that's an interesting question, I think, Natalie, because I think we think leadership is a title and it's not always a title. So when I think about the role that you guys are taking on with Kayak, that is leadership. You guys are developing those leadership skills because what, what do leaders want at the end of the day? They wanna make a contribution. They wanna give back to others. And so, I mean, as much as you can go to university for a leadership course or whatever, really, you don't go to school to, to be a leader. You know, leaders look for chances to make a difference. We make mistakes, we fix our mistakes, we lean on others when we're not feeling like we're strong enough to, to do what we need to do. We find people that are wiser than us and we make sure that we listen to their voice. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we just really want to know that we're leaving something better than we found it. And I think that's true. When I think back on my own career, my very first job was um, in a snack bar in an arena. And, you know, and I, I think if you went and found my boss, from that would be about 1974. <laughs> if you went and found my boss, he would probably tell you that, you know, that I, I don't even remember, but I probably like, you know, organize something in the snack bar, right? Because I think you find your opportunities to demonstrate the leadership. And, um, and I don't think it's always to do with the title. And we all have known people that have had great titles, but maybe didn't have very good leadership skills. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear, um, especially for people that are striving to contribute more. What is it that you want to get out of kayak? And Claire, be warned, and Noel, be warned. I'm going to ask you the same questions. So I, I actually really like your question. So um, I've been with Kids Ability for a couple of years now. Um, I started off um, in grade eight for volunteer hours. And I did I, the I Can Bike program in Kitchener and I really, really liked it because to me it was really inspiring how, I think was, it was within maybe five days we were able to get kids to um, be riding normal bikes. Pretty cool, so to, it? Yeah, it was incredible for me. So um, I came back in grade 10, I volunteered, um, we moved to Waterloo. So I moved to the Waterloo location and I did, um, I started off with Friday night social program so it was, um, I believe it was targeted towards like older clients. Mm. So they were, I would say probably all above in their twenties or something. But to me, that was really, really unique. It was a unique experience because it was basically like almost like a party every month. And um, we were like help them with crafts and everything. And to me, it was like really incredible to hear everyone's story. And then I started with Active Start and Fundamentals. Um, and I really, really loved that program with like the connections you made with the kids and you could see all their progress. So I did that, I think, for about six months. And then I heard about kayak and I found it a great opportunity to start with um, more of a leadership role just to be because I really liked working with kids ability, but then it gave me more um, on like the behind the scenes of what happens at Kids Ability. So I really liked the idea of um, 
seeing how things were run and helping out further in the community. Excellent. And, um, and what do you want to do with all of that? Do you have any um, ideas about what the next phase of your life is going to look like? Yeah, um, so the th I've been asked this question a couple of times, but for me, I've always um, really liked kids. So hopefully, or yeah, so I, I want to be a doctor, hopefully. And the thing is for me, like I've always wanted like the medical field. So I've always thought of becoming maybe like a pediatric doctor because it's almost the same sense that um, sometimes there ki there's kids that here that are nonverbal. And when you treat patients that aren't like their babies, they're nonverbal just as well. So you'll need those types of communication skills and helping people with like possibly disabilities um, as a pediatric doctor would really be interesting to me as well. Excellent. Well, we need a developmental pediatrician in Waterloo. We don't have one. So if you could like accelerate that, you probably could have a job waiting for you at the end of med school because we've been trying to attract a developmental pediatrician for as long as I've worked at Kids Ability. So yeah, once I'm done the 14 years, I'm coming for you guys. <laughs> I might not be here to hire you, but I can leave a note. I can leave a note. How's that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think it like kids' ability has definitely like shaped the way I'm looking at things now and how um, I want to do like my future career. Excellent, excellent. Um, Claire, tell me a little bit about um, what you. I know you're newer to. You're not new to kids' ability, that's for sure. Yeah. you're one of the first kids I met when I came here, but uh, you're newer to kayak, right? Yeah, so I wanted to join kayak um, because I wanted to have a leadership role and meet older kids that were my age. I like to, and I, it would be a good opportunity to make a difference in my own um, community. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And you started that very young, didn't you, when you were um when you were representing kids ability as an ambassador. Yeah. 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 You got a, you got a long resume already. Do you have you thought about what you might want to do? What grade are you in now, Claire? I'm in grade 9. Grade 9. So you got a few years left to decide. Yeah. Yeah. You have you got any ideas yet? Yes, I want to be a child life specialist in hospitals. Could you do it in community agencies like Kids Ability? I haven't explored it that far, but possibly. Because we could maybe offer you a job too. I would like that. Yeah, you and Natalie could even like share an office or something. Because by then you should be <laughs> social distancing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, Noel, how long have you been involved with Kids Ability's kayak? I forget how I found out about kayak, but. I decided hmm, this might be fun, get some extra volunteer hours. So I joined when I was in ninth grade, been with it for a while. It's fun. So. And how many people have you got now in your kayak group? So we have about 21 members. So 14 in the Waterloo group and seven in the Guelph group. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to uh, hear from from some of your friends over this last couple of days about some of the plans that you have for the future. So that's pretty cool. So I just want to welcome Alexandra who's joined us in the meeting. She couldn't be here at the beginning because she uh, was at school, I assume, and now uh, finishing up her school day, but we're glad you're here now. So we had just asked Alexandra people to introduce themselves a little bit about who they are and why they're connected with the kayak group. And um, if you could do that, we would really appreciate that. And then we'll just dive right into your questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, well, I first heard about kayak um, through my aunt, I guess, because my younger cousin um, is very familiar with kayak. He has pretty severe cerebral palsy. And um, so he was working a lot with kayak almost every day, or sorry, not kayak, with kids ability almost every day, I think. Um, just to help him learn how to walk and learn how to um, do fine motor skills. Um, and so I heard about his uh, kayak, so I keep getting it mixed up. I heard about kayak and I thought, what a great way I can kind of give back to this amazing organization that helped my family so much. And so I joined last year 
and yeah, the rest is history. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So, hey. Um, so I was in charge of the personal questions and my first question for you is how did you decide what you wanted to do? So I think I always, I don't think I woke up one day as a little girl and said, when I grow up, I think I'd like to be a CEO of a children's organization. I don't think that happened, but I knew I always wanted to be sort of in the helping profession, always wanted to make a difference. That's kind of, um, a big statement for me to make because um, my mom and dad are immigrants to Canada. My mom stayed home. My dad is an accountant and still practices accounting actually. Um, so to pick a field like social work, like I don't think he even understood what that even meant, right? Um, he thought I should be a lawyer, but it didn't seem that attractive to me to spend that much time in school and, um, and then how much time you'd have to sort of put in before you could really feel like you were, you were making a difference or having an impact. And truthfully, like I was really lousy at science. I was not good at math. I can't sing or dance. And so social work it was. <laughs> and in becoming the CEO, what barriers have gotten in your way and how did you overcome them? You know, I don't know that um, I've really experienced a ton of barriers. I mean, I would say I have experienced in my career perhaps some gender discrimination, but I also have worked in the helping profession, which tends to be more female-led. Um, and but you know, I I will say that there have been occasions in my career where I have certainly felt. Um, that I was judged on my gender as opposed to my skill. But, um, but I think, you know, they might have been setbacks. And I, I can think of one occasion in particular where I didn't get a job that I really wanted. And I really believe that it was based on gender. But, um, but I think those are the things that you, um, you reflect on and you try and figure out and then you figure out what that way is either around or right through that barrier. And, um, and so I'm very fortunate uh, that I have not faced that many barriers in my career. And, um, but, you know, I, um, I think I've had a fairly straight path maybe compared to a lot of people um, in, uh, into this role that I'm in now. Great. What was an aha moment for you working at Kidsability? So I was talking about this a little bit earlier. I actually think I have like aha moments all the time. Um, one of the things that I actually kind of miss about our normal operations, our pre-COVID operations was when I could sit in my office and it would be really noisy and chaotic out there. And sometimes like I just would get up and walk through the weight room or sit in the weight room for a few minutes because it would just kind of be, you know, just, it would be energizing for me. Um, but, you know, even without that, like I have a great day, I have a great job, I love what I do. And, you know, and I have learned to find those aha moments, I think, through COVID in different ways. Um, we've had some, I think, as staff where, you know, I've heard some amazing stories of the resilience of our staff and how they've stepped up and that's been, and I might not have got that opportunity if we weren't in, in these crazy COVID times. Um, I had a bit of an aha moment when I was um, getting ready to have this conversation with you guys in terms of recognizing how far you guys have come. Um, because I think that's kind of the downside to my job. Sometimes I don't get to hear about all those really great aha things. And so um, I really try hard to find them. And, um, and I'm really lucky there's lots of them around disability. What was your most memorable moment with disability? <laughs> So that's a really hard question. And I actually don't know that I can pick one memorable moment. Um, I, but I was thinking about this, and this happened a bunch of years ago. But for some reason, it's still really mu very much in my mind. And so I was in a meeting room here in the Waterloo site. I was working with our finance director. We were working on budget. It was a good news story really struggling with the budget. It was really hard, really stressful, and um, really frustrating. 
And, um, and so we decided we would take a bit of a break and walked out of the meeting room and there was this young man he was quite tall like much taller than me not that that's saying much but he was quite tall and he was walking down the hall and he had like this big custom um like walker kind of thing and um and he was with a couple of our therapists a physio and occupational therapist and and his parents were there and then there were a couple of other adults and then one of the therapists, I just was sort of watching him walk down the hall. And one of the therapists um, said to me that, um, that this young man, and that's what he was, because he was probably about 16 or 17, um, had recently come to Canada. He had come from a refugee camp. It was the first time in his life that he had had a mobility device that allowed him to stand upright and to see the world from an upright position. And because um, he'd never had a piece of equipment before. And so like, I just, I still get very goosebumpy when I tell that story. And I just walked back into the room, walked back in, or, you know, pulled out um, my colleague and said, you need to see this. We stood and we watched this young man and, um, and we walked back in and said, we can fix our budget problem. I don't know how we fixed it in the end, I can't remember, but it was just, it was just like the fact that I, that probably happened maybe five or six years ago. And so that still comes to mind for me. And, um, and I, it, would, it just was like such a visual of why we just need to, you know, get our heads around some of these problems that we think are really insurmountable. Do you have any words of wisdom that you can share with us? So, you know, when I was at, when I was asked earlier about, you know, what, what is leadership and stuff, right? And I talked about how it's not really a title. It's uh, leadership is sort of how you approach a situation and it's really about your characteristics and stuff. And so, you know, I, I don't know if it's wisdom or not, but uh, what I would say is, you know, find the really hardest thing that you can do and then do it the best you possibly can. And when you've done that, move on because somebody else needs that challenge and you need a new one. And um, so I think if, um, if, you know, I don't know if that's words of wisdom, but um, it's worked for me, so. Yeah. Um, what can you do to get where you are now? So my dad, um, once said to me many years ago, when you know, probably when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, um, my dad said to me, and I, I mentioned earlier, my parents are immigrants. Um, I'm a first generation Canadian. And so um, my dad said to me, you know, people work for one of two reasons. You either work for love of money or love of job. And if you're really lucky, you get to find both. So, I mean, I think the most important thing is to figure out what you love and then the rest of it will just kind of take care of itself. Because leadership is really just about what's inside us and what we do with the gifts that we've been given. And what would you be doing right now if you weren't busy being a CEO of Kids Ability? I would probably be a full-time volunteer because I actually hate not being busy. That's been another tough thing for me with COVID is just not having um, like a million things on my plate to do. And uh, so I think if I wasn't here doing this job, I'd probably be, um, you know, bugging everybody looking for volunteer stuff. What are you most proud of? I don't know if you mean that in a, in a work context, but I'm gonna answer it um, from my heart, which is the thing I am most proud of is my two sons. I think they're adults, they don't live with me, they, um, they live out of town, but I'm actually very proud of the two human beings that I have helped put on this planet. And, um, and I'm really proud of the contributions that they're gonna make. And that, that makes me happy. That's so amazing. Um, who is your role model and why? <laughs> I think I have, there's lots of people that I admire for, you know, lots of various things. 
So I'm not sure that I have one in particular that I could say, but, um, but I will say that I am still very lucky enough to still have my mom to look up to. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then our last question for you today is, what is your favorite quote that you live by and why? So I, I actually like quotes. <laughs> so um, here's one from Albert Einstein, who said, now Albert Einstein was a brilliant scientist, who said, I have no special talent. I'm only passionate and curious. So I think that's actually pretty good advice for a leader. So I want to thank Alexandra and Claire and Natalie and Noel for joining me today and asking me some really great questions, like they were questions that, uh, that got me thinking. And, um, and sometimes I think it is important that we stop and we, you know, we just kind of think about some of those things. So those are great questions, guys. Thank you so much for coming up with them. And, um, but I also want to thank you for the opportunity to have had this conversation. We are really interested at Capability about launching this whole new way of talking to one another and learning from one another. And this has been an absolutely amazing start to all of that. And, um, and please come back at some point in the future and um, we'll, you know, we'll pick some other people for you or maybe we'll interview you. But I think it's a really great opportunity for us to, uh, to just keep the channels of communication going. And thank you so much for sharing your time and talents with Kidsability and for giving me a little glimpse into all of that today. It's been great.